G'day and welcome to the Tuna Masterclass at the Melbourne Virtual Boat Show. What a wonder it is to be here and I'm coming to you from the sunny Gold Coast. But through the technology that we have today, I'm able to be there with you in Melbourne and I've got some very exciting news for you because you guys have an exceptional run of bluefin tuna, southern bluefin tuna. And although they might not be the size of this fish, that's up in Canada, and that's about an 800 pound bluefin, you do have some bluefin in exceptional numbers and exceptional quantities these days. And I'm gonna just show you how to go about catching them and uh, some of the tricks and techniques that'll get you success. But before I do, I'd like to point out just how lucky you are these days, because for most of my generation, bluefin tuna have been somewhat a scarce commodity. They were massively overfished by international commercial tuna fleets. And they were taken down to almost collapse of the stock. But through good management and through the assistance of recreational anglers over recent years, the stocks have rebounded. And right now, the stocks are 50% more plentiful than they were when I was a young fella. So you really have a very good chance of catching good numbers of southern bluefin tuna on your doorstep right now. And the fish vary considerably from massive fish like this. Like, who wouldn't want to catch a tuna like that? You're going to feed you and the family for a week or a month with a fish like that. And what a thrill as an angler to catch something like that. But they vary in all sizes, from small, maybe eight or 10 kilos in weight, up to 150 kilos and more. In fact, there are world record size fish here on your doorstep in Victoria. In fact, many world records are now held in Victoria. And there's lots of opportunities for you to go out and catch a world record fish too, particularly if you use some of the lighter line classes. There's lots of opportunities waiting for you. So let's start at the beginning. What sort of boat do you need to go and chase these tuna? Well, the short answer is pretty much anything. If you are safe, and that's the primary concern, if you are safe in a seaworthy boat, it could be something Typical trailer boat like this, and there are lots and lots of even very big bluefin tuna getting caught by small trailer boats like that. Of course, you can go out there in even smaller boats than that and catch tuna, but you then put your safety at risk if the weather comes up. And as you know, the weather down here can get pretty wild at times. So safety is the biggest precaution for what size boat you need. Other than that, have a go. All right, well, let's look at some of the strategies to bring you success. And I'm gonna go through a, a variety of things for you to think about. But first of all, when to fish, and where to fish, and then how to fish. And I'll run you through each of those in the next few minutes. Okay, when to fish. Well, the good news is that whereas there used to be a fairly narrow and defined season for southern bluefin, now they're caught in every month of the year. In fact, they're catching great numbers of bluefin tuna right now on your doorstep. And, and there was a fish, gosh, over 100 kilos caught within the last week. So it really is there waiting for you. It's a huge opportunity. You can catch them in all months of the year, but perhaps the most reliable months are from April to July for the mass of fish, which is fish from six, eight, 10 kilos up to about 40 kilos, the school fish. But the biggest fish, or your best chance of finding a really big fish, over 100 kilos in weight, is from July to October. The bigger fish, often come in at the tail end of the season. But then, as I say, now the one end of the season dovetails with the other end of last year. So you've got a good chance any time of year. All right, let's, um, how, to, how to work out when the tuna are there and on the bite. Now, 
tuna are migratory. In fact, they're highly migratory. They spawn up near Java, up in the Indian Ocean, and they travel down the Western Australian coast, across the Bight, past the coast here, and then down to Tasmania, and then they head off out in the open ocean again. Some of them actually head up the New South Wales coast. So they're continually on the move and they cover a lot of ground. Now, there's lots of schools of tuna out there, but how do you know when there's a school in the vicinity right now? Best way is by social media. It can save you a lot of trips going out there prospecting when perhaps there's no tuna in the vicinity and you're just wasting your time. Social media will let you know whether the bite has been happening in the last few days. And I'd recommend Richard Abella's charter boat, Dreamcatcher 2. His Facebook page is a great indicator of what's going on because Richie's really on the ball. And uh, if there's tuna out there, he generally knows about it and he's usually into them too. So keep an eye on social media and then you'll know when it's worth heading out. Also, tackle stores are a great source of information. You, for various reasons, you need a good tackle store. But one great advantage of a good tackle store is the source of information. And they'll uh, keep you up to date with what's happening day to day. All right, so next step is peak times to go fishing. Now this is a bit of an eye opener for a lot of people because most fishermen even game fishermen who are out there targeting big fish like tuna, they time their day perfectly to miss the fish. It's a tragedy. Most of the fish, particularly tuna, are on the chew early in the morning within the first couple of hours of first light. And then they come on the chew late in the afternoon in the last hour or two before dark. So of course, that's when most people have either gone home or not yet come out, or when they're traveling. You're not gonna catch fish if you haven't got a lure or a bait in the water. If you're really serious, you wanna go out in the dark just before dawn so that you're on the grounds at dawn and you're gonna have a couple of hours of really hot fishing and then maybe you go home and have lunch at home and your day's done, your fishing's done. Or if you're gonna go out later because you just can't get up early, well then stay later and come home on dark because the twilight hours at the either end of the day is the best fishing time for tuna most of the time. Now, a couple other things. Uh, one aspect to think about is on the inshore grounds over the reefy structure, which is a great place to fish, often the fishing will be better on a rising tide. As the tide pushes in, it'll bring clearer water in over the reefs and the movement of the water will kick up nutrients off the bottom as the current hits the reef and you'll tend to get slight upwellings and the bait fish will aggregate and the tuna will then aggregate to eat the bait that have aggregated. So it all comes together and the upcoming or the incoming tide is a slight advantage. So if you can get an incoming tide coinciding with early morning or late afternoon, you've got that much more going for you. Okay, where to fish? Well, there's tuna all over. They are very mobile fish. They move, they move with a the current, they move themselves, they cover a lot of ground hunting for the prey that they want to eat, they're on the move. You can find them anywhere. But your best chance to find them, if they're the smaller uh, majority of the fish, most of the fish are in the sort of 10 to 40 kilo range, the school fish, they're most likely to be found out fairly wide, up around the 100 metre mark, which is the edge of the continental shelf drop-off. So where the shelf or the continental plate that we're sitting on starts to drop off with savage drops into the ocean depths. And the current kicks onto that edge and causes upwellings, which bring nutrients to the surface, which makes the bait fish aggregate and the squid. And you'll get bluefin in that area as well, feeding on them. So out around 100 meters depth, 
And I'll show you in a minute on a, on a contour chart, you'll see that the 100 meters edge is a great hot spot. And that'll be where most of the fish will be. But if you want to target one of those monster fish, one of the really big bluefin, up around 100 kilos or more, often they will be found in on the shallows. And in water depths between 30 metres and 70 metres, you've got a very good chance of finding them over the reef structures. Now, some years back, a decade or two back, a lot of people used to look out on the continental shelf edge. And by that, I mean the 100 fathom mark. And that's about 60 kilometres out off the coast. And a lot of people used to drive out there. And sure, like the 100 metre mark, as you'll see, the 100 metre and the 200 metre, not too far apart, it's part of the same drop. There's a shelf edge or, or a little step on the 100 metre mark. But on the 200, it really drops down into the ocean abyss. That edge is also a great hotspot for finding tuna. But it's a long way out, and you really don't want to get caught by the weather out there. Also, the fish are generally in the smaller bracket. Sure, there's more of them, but they're smaller fish. Again, it depends what you want. If you want to make the run and be sure of catching a fish to take home, head out wide. If you don't care so much about catching a lot of fish and you just want to catch one of those, can't believe it's so big, tuna, 100 kilos plus, try the inshore grounds. And you wait longer, but when you get one, wow, what a fish. Okay, so let's, uh, oh, hang on. Here's a list of some consistently good areas, areas that have produced a lot of fish over the years. So Portland is one of the prime grounds of Victoria, up on the, west, uh, on the uh, South Australian border and including across into South Australia, very good tuna grounds. But Portland and Port Ferry, that's a real hotspot. Also Warrnambool, and Apollo Bay, and even off the entrance to Port Phillip Bay. There's a lot of tuna getting caught there too, and off the entrance to Western Port Bay. And as I mentioned, there was a huge tuna, over 100 kilos, caught off Western Port just recently. So wherever you are, get out there and have a go. There's a good chance of finding bluefin. All right, now, as I mentioned, uh, tuna are always on the move. So where, where should you look? What do you look for? Well, bottom structure plays a huge part in finding fish, in game fishing generally, but particularly with southern bluefin tuna. <coughs> because the bottom structure influences where the prey is going to be. And the prey could be pilchards, sardines, it could be red bait, it could be squid. And the bottom structure is one of the key clues. Now, have a look at the map here, and you can see this is all a shallow region here in Bass Strait down to Tasmania, but you've got a sharp edge down both sides. In fact, you've got a great canyon out here off um, Lakes Entrance, and that's where they catch a lot of broadbill swordfish in that canyon. But down here, you've got this edge, and that's generally where we're fishing for the bluefin. I'm going to show you another chart a bit closer in off Portland. So we've got Portland here, and this edge here is 60 metres. So we're very close to shore, and yet we've got fairly deep water. And out here, this is the uh, continental shelf edge. That's 200 metres where it drops off in a cliff edge down into the ocean depths. But look at this 100 metre line. Like that's a, that's a distinct drop. It's a, it's a little cliff and the, that cliff catches the current and jacks it up and causes these upwellings which generate the bait aggregation which brings in the tuna and they aggregate in the same area. So that step running along the coast and it comes very close to Portland. Off Warrnambool you've got a much longer run and so on. But that step is a great place to look. So bottom structure's really important. All right, what else have we got? Another clue is water temperature. Now, 
The tuna are on the move, but so is the water. And tuna, like other species, have a preference for what temperature water they want to live in. If you're a trout, you want to live in cold mountain streams. And if you took a trout and took it to Darwin and put it in a freshwater stream, it would die, it's just too hot. Still fresh water, they can still breathe, but they're not built for hot water. Same with all fish, they have a temperature preference. Now the temperature preference for the bluefin is between 12 and 18 degrees. And the bigger fish, having more bulk and more fat, can handle and can operate effectively in colder water than the smaller fish because they just don't have the fat and the bulk to retain the heat that they need to operate. So the bigger fish are on the colder end of the scale and anywhere between 12 and 18 degrees you'll find the bluefin. Now, okay, that's the band of temperature we want to look for, but how do you know where to find that water? Well, here's another little tricky thing. Have a look at a satellite water temperature chart or a sea surface temperature chart, SST. You can get these free on the internet through uh, services like the Bureau of Meteorology. But this one is made by Rip Charts and they are a private company. You pay a subscription to get their chart, but it gives you much more detail. And it's that detail which helps us to fine tune where we're gonna go so that rather than hoping to find tuna, we're almost guaranteed of finding tuna. So here we've got little arrows which show us the direction of the current. And that's important, that helps. You can see if we look at some of these arrows here, they're all facing in all sorts of different directions. But we wanna see where the main flow is and then what reef structure that flow is butting up against to cause those upwellings. And the color, <coughs> excuse me, the color codes here will show you the different temperature of the water. Now, of course, you need a color key, which I haven't got on this chart, but the red areas are warmer than the blue areas. If you look down the east coast here, you can see we've got here the extremity of the uh, East Australian current and it's pushing down from Queensland all the way down to the east coast of Tasmania. And as you can see by the arrows, we've got little eddies coming down there as well. But for the bluefin, we're more interested in what's going up through the Gulf, uh, through the Bight, sorry, and, and through Bass Strait and coming down the side here. So temperature can give you some big clues. Here's a closer in view looking at Portland region. So here's Portland. And you can see here that we've got very cold water coming in, in between patches of much warmer water. And between this dark red here and the blue here, that's a significant temperature difference. And that forms a barrier. And the fish are gonna aggregate or bunch up on the edges of that current temperature gradient. Because if you've ever been down the beach in summer swimming and if you've been in the water and you're frolicking away in the shore break having a great time, the water's nice and warm like a bath and all of a sudden you step sideways into a cold patch. You ever done that? What do you do? You flinch and go backwards and you go, geez, that's cold. Well, the tuna do the same. In fact, all fish do the same. If the water temperature suddenly gets outside their comfort zone, they'll move back into the temperature water that they like. And these edges is one of those situations. So you'll get a bunch up of fish around the significant changes in water temperature. And by significant, maybe one degree Celsius is a significant temperature change. So keep an eye for that and you'll find out where the barriers are, the fence edges that are likely to bunch up the tuna. Okay, what else can we show you? Um, now, tuna again on the move. So what are the clues, what are the other clues we can use to find where they're gonna be? One of the greatest clues is by looking into the sky, looking at birds. Birds are a fabulous signpost to show you where the action is. And there's actually a bit of 
background you need to learn about birds because all birds aren't the same. There are some birds that are very relevant to tuna fishing and there's a lot of birds that have very little relevance and it depends on what the birds feed on. If they feed on the same food that the tuna are feeding on, of course, they're very relevant. You watch what they're doing and they will show you where the tuna are. If you watch the wrong birds, they can lead you astray. Now also, there's two different modes of operation that birds or seabirds use. And I'll show you that in a second, but uh, actually, if I go back one, here on screen, you'll see a web address. Now that's for Blue Water Game Fishing website. And on there, we've got a whole bunch of resource materials that are gonna really help you to understand how birds operate, seabirds, relevant to game fishing, and which ones to look at, and which ones, or how to interpret the, the behavior of the ones that are relevant to you. So go to that website, and you'll find a whole lot of free downloads and it'll really help you more than I can go into detail right now. Okay, so back on track. Let's, uh... now you probably recognize this guy. That's a shearwater and that is one very relevant type of bird for tuna fishing because they eat the sort of bait fish that tuna eat. And so we watch them but they have a particular type of hunting method. And let me see if I've got a photo here. Here we go. This bird here and the giant petrel, its cousin, are what they call tube nose seabirds. And they call tube noses because they have a huge nostril. This one's got twin nostrils. They have a huge nostril because these guys are the bloodhounds of the sea or the ocean. And they hunt by sense of smell. So they're the birds, often brown in color, that swoop over the wave tops. And they're down really low to the surface and they're skimming the waves. Amazing flyers. It's just a, a pleasure to watch them zooming over the swells. But the reason they're down so low is because they're sniffing. They're smelling for the oils that come out of the bait fish that the tuna are feeding on. And like a bloodhound, when they get a whiff of that scent, they'll track it down and they'll fly into the wind, they'll go upwind and they'll track down the source of the smell. And if you watch them and you go with them, and particularly where you see a whole lot of them wheeling around and swooping and diving, that's because they've got to the source. They found where the bait fish are getting eaten. What's eating them? The tuna. So watch the birds and they'll guide you to the fish. So that's the bloodhounds birds, the low, low flying tube nose seabirds. But there's another kind that's equally as important. Now, this is a patch of them here. These are gannets, and gannets don't swoop down low over the waves. They fly up high. And the reason is they use a completely different method of hunting. They are visual hunters. So they're high, like an eagle, up high where they can have a huge panoramic view of the ocean. And they're looking for the bait fish or for the tuna and the splashing and the flashing of, of tuna underneath. And with their eyesight, they pick up the bait balls of fish, the sardines and the red bait and so on, that are getting eaten by the tuna. And then you'll see them dive bomb down. Now that's an amazing sight too. There's some really spectacular nature going on out there. And you'll even have uh, dolphins getting in on the action and seals sometimes too. But these gannets, they fly high, and when you see an aggregation of gannets up in the sky, get over there. And when they start bombing, that's because they're diving down to eat the sardines. Now, the reason the sardines are up near the surface where the gannets can get them, and the reason the sardines are packed together in a tight ball, which is why all these birds are in the one area, dive bombing just one small area, the reason that's happening is because the tuna have corralled 
the school of bait fish and forced them to the surface. Because then the bait fish are trapped and the tuna can pick them off underneath and the bait fish can't get away. But the birds wait for this to happen and they're coming to get them from the other side. The poor bait fish are trapped in the middle. But use these clues, look at the sky, look at the surface and see the brown skimming birds and that'll show you where the action is. Okay, so how do we fish for these fish? Well, there's four primary strategies that I want to run you through. And which strategy you use depends on the situation. Each have their advantages and each have disadvantages. So let me run you through them. And which strategy is best on the given day will depend on how easy the tuna are to find, whether you've got to do a lot of searching or whether you know where they are, how wary they are. And believe me, tuna can be extremely wary at times. Really a problem if you don't know the right tricks. And also what depth are the tuna swimming at? Now, we hope that they're up on the surface chasing a school of sardines and trapping them on the top with the birds and the whole catastrophe scene going on. Then they're easy. But sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're down deep and you can actually pick up a school of tuna working a deep school of bait on your sounder. And if you find them, you might troll across the surface, but you're not gonna reach where the action is down low. So we have a strategy for that too. All right, let's run through some of the options. Now, the first option and the easiest option and the option most people take advantage of is trolling. And this is simply letting a couple of lures out behind the boat and going for a drive. Now, some people put the lures out in the middle of nowhere and just drive and they spend hours and hours and hours waiting, days waiting, because they're not in the right area. Some of the clues that I gave you earlier, the right depth, the right bottom structure, the right water temperature, is all methods to pinpoint where the needle in the haystack's gonna be. And then if you know roughly where you wanna go, put out some lures and troll them at six to eight knots trolling speed behind your boat, you should find action. Now, there are many types of lures and I'm gonna show you some of the best ones for the bluefin. And lots of different lures will catch fish on different days. And uh, one of the great things about trolling is that you can put multiple lines out. Trolling four different lines is easy, even for a small boat. But with a little bit of care and a little bit of technique, boats, even small trailer boats, can troll six or maybe even eight lines and not get into trouble. And you will then have the opportunity to have lots of different options. So let's look at some of those options. One that I'd like to recommend to you is a swimming diving minnow lure. Now this one is a Halco Laser Pro, which is my favorite. But there are several other kinds of lures like this. Rapala make another very good one. And one of the things that determines how well these lures work is what trolling speed they will handle. A lot of this shape of lure are made for small inshore fish like barramundi or flathead or in slightly different shape, things like Murray Cod and so on. You really need a high speed trolling version. And the Halco Laser Pro is one of the best in the world at trolling at high speeds. This lure will handle up to 10 knots without flipping out of the water, tangling and being ineffective. This is a deadly weapon and there have been tuna well over 100 kilos caught on this little fish, on this little lure. Now, here's another variation. This is the next size smaller. This, the larger one is a Halco Laser Pro 190 Deep Diver. This one is the slightly smaller version in a shallow diver. Now the difference between the shallow and the deep is determined by the shape and the size 
of the lip on the front. You can see this lip is at quite a steep angle, like a 45 degree angle from the uh, head of the, of the lure, whereas the deeper diver has a much longer lip and that grabs more water and drags it down. But it's also on a much shallower angle, almost parallel with the body of the lure. That signifies a deep diver. Now, either of the shallow or the deep will be very effective for the tuna. The deep diver is only going to get down a couple of metres. So to a tuna in 100 metres of water, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Both are good. But what does make a difference is how well they will stay in the water at six to eight knots trolling speed. Another variation of this type of lure is what we call a bibless minnow or a lipless crankbait if you're American. And this is the same sort of bait fish profile, slim body, tapered body, a bit like a bait fish a sardine, a mackerel, a yellowtail, that sort of thing. And rather than having a lip at the front, this one is designed with the toe point on the top of the head. So the forehead of the lure actually becomes the diving paravane that drags it down. These won't dive as deep and they don't have as much grip on the water because they've got a very slim forehead, but they do handle a lot of speed and this lure will actually track in the water up to 15 knots uh, and they have a very good swimming action at six to eight knots which is typical trolling speed. Here's the thing, the payload that these lures can carry and swim at makes a big difference to your success depending on how strong a line you want to use. If you're after smaller tuna with the lighter tackle, this lure here is a deadly weapon. But it has treble hooks on it, triple hooks. And each of those hooks, there's three of them on each one of course, but each one is only a 4-0 hook, which is like a snapper hook. So you're trying to catch a huge tuna with perhaps powerful tackle with a 4-0 hook. The risk there is that the hook can either straighten out or pull out, tear out. It, it's a great hook, but it doesn't have a lot of holding power for heavy pressure. This type of lure, however, has much larger hooks. Those hooks are about twice the size. It's a single hook. And this lure has been designed to carry single hooks. You can actually retrofit this lure with single hooks, but even so, this bibless lure has the capacity to tow and swim with a much larger hook. So if you're after the really big tuna and you want to use really powerful tackle, say 50 pound line or 80 pound line, which is 24 kilo or 37 kilo tackle, this type of lure with the bigger hooks is going to give you a much more secure connection and help you to land that fish after a big battle. But those diving lures are red hot and not enough anglers know that they are a good option. The more traditional option, which most people use, is a skirted lure. And this is the sort of thing that down the east coast we might use for yellowfin tuna or marlin or sailfish and so on up in the tropics. But this skirted lure is also an excellent tuna catcher. They really do catch a lot of fish and most people will be using this kind of lure. Now they vary in shape and size from lures like this with a fairly long head to lures with a fairly short head. And that makes a difference. Rule of thumb, the ones with the short head, you run close to the boat, and the ones with the long head, you run further back behind the boat. The reason is that the ones with the long head have more planing surface on the head, and so they're able to lift up and plane at the surface, and you'll get more 
and better action out of them when they're a long way back behind the boat. The short-headed lure is able to pivot, so it has more action, it has more swimming action, but works best close to the boat with a steep towing angle from the rod tip. As the line gets flatter because it's further back, then you need to revert to a longer head. And in extreme cases, here's a lure that's a bit like a, uh, a garfish in shape. And it has a very long head, which again is very good for running in the very far back position behind the boat. It still has a good vibrant action. A small action, a tight little wobble, but it will have a tight little wobble and it will stay up on the surface and what we call smoke. Now, the smoke or the bubble trail is an important aspect of this kind of lure. Think of it this way. Have you ever been out on a humid day and looked up into the sky and it's a clear blue sky and all of a sudden you see this streak of white cloud, a vapour trail. And you follow that vapour trail up and there at the front end of that vapour trail is a little tiny silver speck which is the aeroplane that caused the vapour trail. You would never have seen the aeroplane if it hadn't been for the vapour trail. But you follow it up and sure enough there at the front end, there is the speck. These lures work on exactly the same principle. It's a huge, big, blue, vast ocean out there. And the tuna are out there looking for a little sardine to eat. Now a lone sardine or a small pack of a couple of sardines out there in the big blue ocean could easily be missed. They're a little tiny target in a very big ocean. The smoke trail made by these lures looks like a bait fish that's terrified leaping out of the water and causing a bubble trail and the tuna pick up on that and they zoom in and sure enough there at the front end of that bubble trail is the little speck, not an aeroplane, a little sardine. And there it is, there's the little sardine. And they go, aha, now I found you. And they'll race up and nail it. So the smoke trail is a pretty important aspect of these type of trolling lures. And you want to achieve that by using the right size head in the right position behind the boat. But here's something completely different uh, or, or a different way of looking at that. And this is a, another skirted lure, but this one is the stealth model. Now, it doesn't always work, but this often does work. And it's what we call a bullet head. And as you can see, it's got a slim tapered head. This one's a very nice one, handmade in Hawaii. And it's got shell inlays to give it a real natural sort of glow in the sun. But that tapered bullet head has a very subtle action and it will just, it will swim, it will meander through the water without a bubble trail. Now, you lose the benefit of having the bubble trail show the tuna where the lure is or that the lure even exists out there. But sometimes when the tuna are a bit wary and a bit sensitive, the smoking bubble trail of these lures can make them balk and put them off a little. Having one of these out, and usually right at the back of the pattern, right out the back, having one of these bullets will often catch the wary tuna. And they are also a deadly lure to have in your spread. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the great things about trolling is that you have the opportunity to have a whole variety of different lures. So you might have one of these out the back, you might have a short-headed smoking lure in close to the boat. You might have a longish head out fairly wide. And then you might have a different size, in this case a slightly bigger lure, representing more something like a slimy mackerel. You might have that mid-range and so on. And if you want the little tiny tuna, then you might want to have a smaller one, something like this, which you've got different size options. Here's another one. This is a very squiddy looking lure. Again, a bullet head, but it's been dressed in a sort of a muddy brown and pink color. Very squiddy, 
and tuna love to eat squid, so there's days when this is a deadly weapon too. So there are lots of options in lures, but have a mix and uh, space them out behind the boat and go for a troll, and I'm sure you'll find success. Now, let me show you some diagrams. When you position your lures behind the boat, you want to stagger them for a couple of reasons. If you stagger them as you turn the boat and as the wind blows the line, they're not going to cross over each other and tangle. And you really don't want to have a whole bunch of these lures all tangled. That, that's a nightmare. If you stagger them behind the boat, the boat can turn, fish can grab one lure out of the whole pack and you're not going to get tangles. They're going to over and under each other line. Here's what it looks like looking down from above. So one uh, in the center, one off to the right hand side, one to the left, one to the right, one to the left, staggered as you go. And you can use the little pressure waves behind the boat as a guide. And you might count, you know, two or three waves behind and then four wave and five wave and six wave and position your lures accordingly. I'll show you enough. And obviously you've got deep divers and uh, medium deep or shallow runners mixed in amongst the skirted lures there as well. So, lost my cursor. Oh, sorry, here we go. All right, now, <clears throat> here we have a trailer boat and this one's been rigged up with two outriggers one either side and a center rigger. And this is a perfect setup for trolling lots of lines from a reasonably small boat. And the reason is he's got lines coming out from the rod holder rods down low. He's got one, two, three set with lines. And then he's got outrigger lines and the outriggers just double the width of the boat or treble the width of the boat by having these arms out each side. And on the top of the outrigger line, you've got a release clip. And in this case, we're running stinger lines or tag lines as well. I won't go into that now, but there are resources on our website which will teach you all this sort of stuff. But outriggers with tag lines is a really effective way to troll more lines better and with less tangles. And the center rigger lets you have another one again. Now, one of the essential parts about getting your lures to work well with the smoke trail and with the swimming action that you want them to have is the angle of pull. If you have a lure close to the boat, it's got a steep angle of pull because the rod tip is fairly close to the lure in the water. The further the lure gets back, the more that angle drops. And if you've got a lure way behind the boat, the angle is almost flat. Now that's not lifting the lure to the surface and letting it do its thing. It's bogging it down. You're also having the leader, which is quite visible, and the swivel in the water where the tuna can also see it. And that will put them off as they're coming up to grab your lure. But most importantly, the lure won't work and do its thing effectively. So the towing angle is important. What the outriggers do and what the center rigger does is give you the towing angle for the lures that are way out the back. So you've got the height to lift the leader up out of the water. So most of the leader is out of the waves and you've got the swivel out of the water, so the tuna aren't seeing that either, and the lure is freed up to do its thing, and you'll catch a lot more fish. Now, with those release clips, when the fish strikes, the release clip lets the line go, and then the line comes down and it's straight off the rod tip again, and you pick it up and away you go. Okay, so here we have a, another view of a trolling spread behind the boat. You can see on the diagram here, we've got a center rigger, and this is the line coming up. The orange there 
is the tag line. We've got a rubber band here which breaks, that's the release clip. The line here is going out to the lure way out the back. The two outriggers here, again, we've got the orange, which is the tag line with a breakaway rubber band on each line. And then these lines go to the reasonably far back lures. And the short lures are positioned on different pressure waves behind the back of the boat at staggered intervals from the two flat lines or the, the lines off the rod tip from the boat. There's an overview. And again, this allows you to troll multiple lures so you have multiple options. You can have big ones, you can have small ones, you can have blue ones, you can have pink ones, you can have green ones, you can have whatever you want. You can mix it up, you can have diving minnows, you can have smoking skirted lures. You've got options. And on one day, the fish will strike this, and on a different day, they'll strike that. And it may be because of weather conditions, the cloud cover, the lighting. It may be because of the food source, maybe just because of the mood of the fish. They do vary and different techniques, different lures work on different days. Okay, so let's move along. And now this is an important one. When you find a school of fish on the surface and you've got the birds working and the fish are splashing and it's all happening, do not get too close to the action. Do not go driving through the fish. If you do, if you drive through the middle of the school, the boat will get there long before the lures do that are out the back. The boat will spook the fish. The boat will spook the bait fish. The, bait, the boat will spook the tuna. They will all scatter and then that feeding bait ball that the tuna had worked so hard to achieve to pack the bait fish into a tight school bundle and force them to the surface, that game's over. You just scattered it. So the fishing game's over. You're not going to catch any fish. The tuna are going to dive one way, the bait fish are going to dive. Game's over. Much better. Let the bait fish and the tuna continue their feeding spree here and you drive the boat up along the outside of the school then when you're past the school duck in front the lures if they're out the back will angle across as you make the turn around in front of the school the the lures will pull across and intercept the lead fish or the skirting edge of the school you will catch fish you haven't spooked the rest of them. You can then go around, catch your fish, come back up behind the school, make another pass, catch another one, and do it over and over again until their feeding spree's ended. You'll catch multiple fish. Other boats can catch multiple fish and you haven't spooked them. It's a much more successful way to go. Okay, now strategy number two. If trolling's not working, sometimes these fish can be really wary, like really wary, to the point of most anglers just get frustrated, rip their hair out and go home with nothing. But there are tactics that can work even then. One tactic is to get upwind of the school and cast with lures down into them, because then you can, you certainly got the boat out of gear and it's just parked there drifting. And modern motors are so quiet that uh, that's not gonna spook the fish. So you get upwind on the edge of casting range, fire a lure downwind with the wind and into the school and then crank it back and skip your lure across the surface, looking like one of those terrified bait fish that's jumping out trying to get away. And not only is that a very effective technique when the fish are wary, it's also one of the most exciting because you're physically casting and spinning and then you can see the fish hit because they'll smash it on the surface and you get this enormous eruption and spray, like it's really wild. And of course, then you get the hook up and you feel it from the instant they hook. So it's a really exciting and engaged way to go fishing. The sort of lure that you'd use is something like this. Now have a look at that. That's, that's a handmade, hand painted custom lure 
but it's imported by Ebb Tide Tackle, a Victorian tackle store specialising in this sort of gear. But have a look at that. If that's not a real anchovy, like, pfft, that's an amazing representation. So, lures like that, stick baits, is a great way to go. Now, another strategy I mentioned earlier, when the fish are deep, you can see here a patch of bait, and these long streaks here, they're probably tuna, southern bluefin tuna, that are rounding up this patch of bait, and they're down in 40 meters. Now, if those fish, if you find them, perhaps there's a lot of birds in the area that signify something's going on, but you can't find it working on the surface. The trolling lures aren't getting hit. If you find the action, and, and these fish are down 70 meters down on the bottom as well. If you can see bluefin down on your sounder, another way to go is to drift and drop a jig down. Now a metal jig, this one is 250 grams, and that's a broad sort of leaf shaped jig. And you, this one's not rigged obviously, but you'd rig that with assist hooks. And if you drop that down through the bait school or down to the bottom and then rip it back up, you will catch tuna on that. And if you're in really deep water or there's a strong drift or current, a knife jig or a, uh, a long thin metal jig, like this one here I think is about 250 grams, that long sliver of metal is gonna sink like a plummet down to the depths. And, and again, if you rip that back up at high speed, that will catch tuna. So jigging can be a great way when you know that the tuna are there, but they won't come up to the surface and feed. Strategy number three is drifting. Now, this one, or in this case, I'm talking about using burley to bring the fish up and create them uh, into a feeding frenzy and, and it's a very, very effective way to catch tuna. It's not done much in Victoria, but I've done a lot of it down the east coast for uh, yellowfin tuna. And I've also done it with huge success in Canada, chasing the giant Atlantic bluefin. And we've caught bluefin up to, well, I've caught them up to 1,100 pounds on the strategy I'm gonna show you now. And this little video will just give you an idea. Now these are yellowfin tuna. This was shot by Alastair McGlashan off New South Wales. But you can see the little chunks of cut pilchards. And that chunk trail has brought the tuna up to the surface and they're sipping down those chunks of pilchard. Now, the way we do that is to rig a pilchard like this. You can see here a pilchard with a, a short shank stocky game fishing hook with a little length of copper wire or soft stainless like fuse wire and we poke it up through the head and then bind it around and you end up with a bait like this on a fairly light leader maybe uh, 100 pound to 150 pound monofilament leader or even better fluorocarbon leader and then you drop that pilchard free falling down as you're throwing over chunks of burley. And it is a very, uh, very, very successful technique for the tuna. All right, now we've got a few minutes left, so I just want to run you through a couple of accessories and a bit of a tackle. To catch these big tuna, you are going to need some serious tackle. These are very powerful fish. This is the sort of gear that I would suggest. It's a lever drag reel. So you've got a, a lever on the side here that controls the pressure on your line and that enables you to adjust the pressure according to the battle and put maximum load on, which you can pre-check before the battle using a set of weighing scales, which I always do every time I go fishing. Check the drag and the reel has a line capacity of about 1,000 meters of line. Now that sounds a huge amount of line, but there are times when I've had most of that out and you also don't want to be down to the core of your reel because that will change the drag. So I would always recommend a reel, a lever drag game fishing reel 
with a capacity of 1,000 metres of the line that you choose. The rod also, not imperative, but strongly recommended, it has roller guides. These reduce the friction. Now, a lot of people catch a lot of big fish on rods without roller guides, but they're gonna chew through their line quicker. And it means that you have to replace the line on your reel, which might cost 50 or $60, because the guides under the pressure and the heat of the battle with these fish, the pressure is gonna burn the line and, and, and weaken it. So you have to replace it more often. Roller guides just protect you against that pressure. So there you go, get a short rod. This one's sort of five foot six in length. It's fairly flexible in the tip, but it's very powerful in the butt. And it's got a real fighting pressure here that you can, that you can really steer and lift the fish with. An outfit like that, um, well, then it's a matter of how strong and how much you want to challenge yourself. If you're after the school size fish of 10 to 20, 30 kilos, you could use line of say 10 kilo breaking strain. That one I just showed you is 15 kilos. And for the size fish that you have in Victoria, that would be considered sporting. Most people hoping to catch one of these 100 kilo fish are gonna fish with 24 kilo or 50 pound breaking strain line. And some people who really wanna make sure they catch that big one, they're using 37 kilo tackle or 80 pound line. So horses for courses, the more challenging you make it, the more excitement you're gonna get from it. But um, check it out. Now on our website, we have lots of resources that are gonna help you to find and catch and work out the tackle better for game fishing. So visit us at www.bluewatergamefishing.com.au and uh, we'd love to show you more. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you get out there next weekend and catch some of these bluefin and uh, it's a fantastic resource that you've got on your doorstep. They are delicious fish. Don't waste them. Make use of them. Catch them carefully. Gaff them in the head so you don't wreck the flesh with the gaff wound. Lift them into the boat. Bleed them. Kill them quickly. Bleed them. And then get them on ice so they don't deteriorate. Very important. Get ice into the belly cavity and around them. Pack them in an ice slurry, preferably. And you have some spectacular eating ahead of you. If you'd like to know more of that, visit Tuna Champions. And uh, if you get onto our website at Blue Water, or if you just Google Tuna Champions, you'll find out more of the guidance that they can give you on how to uh, preserve your fish, how to care for it better, how to prepare it to get better meals. And you've got some great fishing coming up. I really enjoy it. See you next time.